standing, could we just could we just raise our hands before the Lord right now? Father, we come right now to say, let all the other names fade away. Let all the other names fade away. Till there's only you in this building. Till there's only you. Lord, I love what that young lady from Karen said. I'm here to see Jesus. Lord, we're here to see Jesus. We don't want to see anything else. We don't want to hear anyone else. We want to see Jesus today. And so, Father God, strip away, strip away anything that would come in your way and help us to see you, Lord. Lord, many people have come from far, have left things, have sacrificed things to be here. I thank you that, Lord Jesus, they will find you. You've told us that we will seek you and we will find you when we seek you with all our hearts. And right now we are holding on to that promise. And we're saying, Lord, we want to see you. And so open the eyes of our hearts. Open us up. Do your surgery. Remove whatever you don't want. Put in whatever you need, Lord. Help us to see you. For we pray this in Jesus' mighty name and God's people say, Amen. Come on. Amen. You may have your... Amen. Wow, wow, wow. Let me see if this thing is okay. Can you hear me? Awesome, awesome, awesome. How many are ready for the best day of your life? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is amazing. You know, I find it hard to out-hype God. Like, I can't say too much about God's power. I can't say too much about God's presence. I can't tell you God is going to do things you've never heard. I'm not sure this thing is... Can it handle? I don't think this thing can handle me. Give me a real mic if it can't handle me. PA guys. Check. Check, check, check. Check, check. Check. Okay, let me just have this as a backup. All right. Amen. Let me just see how many people, again, first time at a gathering. Let me just see, show of hands. Let's just appreciate them. Let's appreciate every single one of them. Wow, 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 wow. Let me see how many have been here for every single gathering. Let me see. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. This, these ones, these are the OGs. Um, let me just give a shout out. Any campuses that have been planted since our last gathering in February? All right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> Let me invite Pastor Nyamo. Just come up on stage, Pastor Nyamo. Wow, wow, wow. Um, I don't know why Pastor Baji is not on stage. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know why he's not on stage. Huh? I'm not sure why he's not here. Is Pastor Irene here? Is Pastor Irene here? You guys don't even know who Pastor Irene is. Okay, she hasn't, she hasn't made it yet. All right, okay. So, why aren't you shouting when I'm asking for campuses? <laughs> Tell us about what's happening at Roca. Amen. Uh, it's so good to you be can there. see she has her army here. <laughs> yes. Um, since we planted Draka, we planted Draka on the 15th of January. I remember we were just two DGs when we planted. Uh, right now we are four and we're about to multiply to be seven DGs. Oh. Come on. Come on, come and, and, on. And for me, I think the thing that I've seen, I've seen God move. Yeah. I've seen people who weren't going to church at all come to church, plug into church, come to church every Sunday, wow. and just be like, the love I've received here Amen. has been life-transforming. I've seen people who, you know, we prayed for them to come to church, and they're coming to church. And yeah. not only are they coming, but they're coming, they're serving, they're plugged in, and they're receiving God's love Amen. from Abunuraka. And I love that we are here with a bunch of people from Raka. Yes. <laughs> Hey. Who are here for the very first the noisiest, time? The noisiest Mavuno Church. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amen. 
I think whenever we have family nights, everybody knows Mavunaroaka now. Wameji <laughs> brand. They have branded themselves. Eh? I love it. Baji, tell me about <laughs> Mavuno right Rende. Hey, Mavuno. Praise God. Praise God once more. There is the army over there. Oh. <laughs> Amen. Wow. Actually, before I even talk, uh, I would like to thank my dad, Pastor Milton. Come on, come on. Uh, <laughs> come on, daddy. <laughs> yeah. uh, through, through him believing in me to start my crazy ministry, Mavuno Right Rende. We usually. We usually just, just translate. Oh. Because there are people from Uganda, from okay. other places. What does Right Rende mean? Right uh, Rende means a group or a clique. But right, I believe we know right. Yeah, rende, rende is a shame word, which means a group or a clique. And so the right group. Yeah, the Amen. right group actually. Mavuno right rende. Yeah. Come on, somebody. Yeah, right yeah. So we usually, thank you guys, thank you guys. <laughs> so we usually meet each and every Friday from 2 to 5.30. 2 to 5.30. Yeah, and... We are 450 youth. <laughs> wow. By the way, I hear... I, I, okay. I've heard that your church is the only church that has no chairs. Exactly. Two and a half hours standing the whole time. Exactly. Until even the sermon they stand. Exactly. Guys, if you want to know church, Mavuno right render. Where do you guys meet? Uh, each and every side. Where? At Mavuno Masharik. So they meet at the Point Mall, yeah. uh, where Masharik, Mavuno Masharik meets. Uh, that's where they are, until the Lord gives them their own land. Yeah. Amen, 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 amen. And you guys have produced, I know you've produced some music now. Yeah, actually we are working on an album. You're working on an album? Yeah. Is there a, a, a music video yet, or it's still on? Not yet. But the music is there. Yeah. So over break, we can hear some of your music. Exactly. Amen. Yeah. Come on, let's appreciate. Mavuno Ruaka, Mavuno Right Rende. Let me ask pastors, pastors, Pastor Nyamu, Pastor, Pastor Baji, Pastor Baji, just come, just stand over here. Let me ask us all to just stretch out our hands right now and just speak a blessing over these churches. Just speak a blessing. Raise your voice right now before the Lord and just declare blessings, declare establishment, declare that the Lord will be glorified in these churches. Declare that they will multiply and that they will fill the earth and that the Father's glory would be seen. That these leaders will stand and lead many, that armies would arise around them in Jesus' name. Father, we bless you. We honor you. Listen to our prayers on behalf of your children. We glorify you, your worthy Lord. Let your glory be seen. Let your power be known because of these churches. We love you, Lord, and we bless you. For we pray these things in Jesus' name and God's Amen. amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much. Amen, amen. Bless the Lord. Are you going to leave me with my backup? Just, just leave my backup here. I don't know if this one will manage me. You know, going off, huh? Let me use. I'm just going to use this PA. All right. Um, ask your neighbor. When are you planting yours? Yeah, we can't just be coming for gatherings, 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 and you haven't planted yours. Pastor Shiks, when are, when are you planting yours? Yeah, it's not just for cheering for other people. <laughs> I was, uh, the, other the other campus that we, uh, Pastor Irene had told me she's on, she'll, she'll be here. She's from Mavuno Diani, and they started. So let me tell you about her story. She, she um, moved from, she was part of Mavuno South, moved to Diani. And when she went there, uh, the Lord just allowed her to have a big house. Uh, the company gave her a nice house. And so she basically came to, the, to a gathering. I think, the, was, was it two gatherings ago? And felt that the Lord was telling her she would plant a church. And so she went, my, my wife and I were going, we decided to pass through Diani, we have some friends, we, we decided to pass there, we were on holiday, and she said, if you're coming, come and visit my house. So we visited her house, and while we were there, she, remember, she, she told us, by the way, I put up my hand to plant a church. And so we said, why haven't you done it? She said, I don't know. 
And so we said, uh, we're here on Sunday, so we just planted. And she said, yeah. So she called her friends. Uh, I remember that was, was, was that Friday? I think it was Friday we had the conversation. She called all her friends. She told them, my pastors are in town. We're doing dinner tomorrow. So on Saturday, we did a dinner with her friends. She told them about the vision of Mavuno Diani. The next day, we planted Mavuno Diani in her sitting room. In her sitting room. And she basically, she put on her TV. That day, I was preaching on the TV. So I decided, I, let me not preach, because I'm already, pre I preached a very good sermon on the TV. So I said, why should I preach again? So we all sat and we listened with her friends. Some of them had not been to church for a long time. And after the service, uh, we, we put off the TV and we just asked, what did God say? Oh my goodness, guys were so real. In fact, I just said, Mavuno is just, there's an anointing of realness. Because these people had not even been to a Mavuno church before, but it just began with people just getting real. We had such a fantastic time. We prayed for people. And then afterwards, we had snacks and people said, this is our church. Uh, so she told me a couple of stories. I'm going to share them because she's not here to share them. Um, the first one she said, one of, her, one of the friends who came on Saturday had to fly away, so she wasn't there for the lunch. But she came, and then she, she came and spent the night so she could be there for church the next morning. She lives about an hour away. And they woke up in the morning, because church starts at 10, they started praying uh, early. They were just praying. And she says the Holy Spirit just came down upon them, and they just found themselves. This girl had never spoken in tongues. She started speaking in tongues. She spoke for a whole hour in tongues before the service started. And she said, revival is already happening in our church. We're so few, but God is already working. There's one person in their church who, who in fact, I remember being introduced to him. I'm even the one who invited him to come and attend, but she's her, he's her good friend. She had introduced me to him. Uh, but he has already told her, because I work in real estate, uh, I'm getting, I'm donating land so that we can start a church, we can build our, our building. So that's Mavuno Diani, and God is doing some exciting, exciting things in Diani. Again, ask your neighbor, when is yours, by the way? Just, I, I missed the first time. I, I missed what you said the first time. When is yours happening? Amen. 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 I had, uh, in, in the morning today, Pastor Grace told us that she has, she and Mavuno Karen are planting uh, London. She and some people in Mavuno Karen have decided they're planting London. And not, they, they've not decided, they've bought tickets to go to London. They don't know what they're going to find there, but they're like, we are going. They're going. They're just going to go and see what God does. And, and then she said, if, since we're in London, Paris is just over here. <laughs> over. We'll just go to Paris over here. And also see what God can do. By the way, I have a friend in Paris, so I can hook you up. Talk to me after this, and let's see what the Lord is going to do. God is in the business of raising an army. God is in the business of raising an army. And I think there's such, these are exciting times to be alive. Tell your neighbor, I'm so glad you're here now. Yeah. People are going to be reading these stories. But you were there, you know? You were there when God was doing it. Today, oh, by the way, Pastor Godi, see, I thought we planted Mavuno Kamakis. Seriously? How are, you, how are they missing the blessings? Or oh, they're not here today? They're here. By the way, when there are blessings being given, you come and demand your blessing. You don't sit there when people are being prayed for. Who is Mavuno Kamakis? Can they stand? Where, where are they? Where are they? This is the latest Mavuno church. Can they wave? If, if there's a Kamu okay, that's Mavuno Kamakis over there. Praise God for you. Bless God for you. There's someone else over here. Praise God for you. Amen. To God be the glory. Wow. Babies everywhere. <laughs> Amen. So that's four churches, huh? Since February. Just, just ask your neighbor again. When, when is yours, by the way? I forgot. Because I, I thought you told me something. I thought I had something that you said. Amen. <laughs> so today, our theme for today is the heart of a follower. The heart of a follower. That's what we're going to be talking about the whole day today. 
Uh, and I really believe that the Holy Spirit has something he wants to deposit in us. I'm so glad you're here. If you came here thinking that you're just going to come in, catch the first session, and then go where you're going, just tell your neighbor, whoa. <laughs> I'm so sad for you because you won't be able to leave this place because the Holy Spirit is in the house and there's something he wants to do. How many of you have ever feared that if you surrendered your life completely to God, he might ask you to do something, to give up something, or to go somewhere that you really don't want. Let me just see, show of hands. Let me see the honest ones in the room. <laughs> By the way, my hand is quite high right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there's, there's that thing of God, I want to surrender like Kini. <laughs> I'm not yet married. I'm not yet married. I, I, I might surrender, then you tell me, let me just first get married, then I surrender completely. Because you might ask me to give up something. I, 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 maybe you might ask me to go to Somalia. Afghanistan. Mavuno Afghanistan. Look at your neighbor. Do they look like Mavuno Afghanistan? They look Taliban. <laughs> uh, their life is the bomb. <laughs> Or is it their wife who's the bomb? <laughs> yeah, God, you might ask me. You might ask me to go to somewhere I don't want to go. You might ask me to quit something I don't want to quit. I like my job. I like my car. I like my house. I like my life. You might ask me to, 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 to start something. So today I want to talk about something really different. I want to talk about the joy of surrender. The joy of surrender. You know, because surrender often carries a negative connotation to us. When we think of surrender, what do you think of? Pain, giving up, death, no control, losing, yeah? The movie is about to end. <laughs> it's over. Nobody likes to surrender. When we think of surrender, we think of, you know, the, the words that say surrender are words like yield, submit, concede, cave in, succumb, quit, give up, resign. You know, if somebody tells you that they succumbed to a disease, what does that mean? They died. They died. Who wants to die? You know? Uh, when somebody says that they resigned from work, it means they left their job. They left it. They don't have a job anymore. When someone gives up, it means that the thing that they thought they would achieve, they can't. They've quit. It's too much. And they've decided they can't do it anymore. When someone submits, submit is, have you ever seen in wrestling when the guy is on the ground and he's being pinned and he's like, <laughs> it's like it's over. I can't fight anymore. I'm done. You win. I lose. Nobody likes to lose. So we don't like the whole connotation of surrender. And when you submit, it means you lose control. How many people like to be in control? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Some of us, by the way, control is everything. We like, we like our control. You know, it's very interesting. Back in the day, um, when people used to, any of you grew up in that time when people used to say, my name is so-and-so and I'm saved and Jesus is Lord and Savior. <laughs> Jesus is my Lord and Savior. You know, it's very interesting because when I got saved, I wasn't taught that those two things go the, together. I thought you could have a Savior first, and then you decide whether you want to have a Lord. I, I thought that there was a division between those two things. I, I thought, you know, first of all, you get saved for insurance. <laughs> Anybody who got saved for insurance? Your, the preacher came and painted a good picture of hell and fire and pain and torture, demons everywhere. <laughs> and when he was finished, he said, come and surrender. You came up to give your life to Jesus. You didn't want to go to hell. You wanted to be saved. And, and, and many of us, we got saved because we wanted a savior. We wanted insurance. But we were not ready for a Lord. We're not ready to be told what to do. But there's a joy of surrender. And I want to share with you several things, several factors that make surrender the best thing that you could do with your life. You know, 
Surrender, number one, is the reason why Jesus came. Surrender is the reason why Jesus came. You know, Jesus did not come to be fire insurance from, for you. He didn't come just to keep you from hell. He had a much bigger reason why he came. Jesus didn't come so that you can live by a, a list of, rule, of do's and don'ts. You know, some people think getting saved is now, okay, there are some things I know I don't do, and then there are other things I can do. No, he didn't come for a list of rules, do's and don'ts. The purpose of Jesus' coming was to resolve the leadership crisis in the universe. Because in the universe right now, there is a leadership crisis. There is a problem of leadership. And the reason that Jesus came was to resolve the problem of leadership. And you know why the problem exists? It's because the, the universe has one king. One king. His name is Jehovah. He made the heavens and the earth. Psalm 24 verse 1 tells us the earth is the Lord's end. Everything in it. Everything in it. Everything is God's. He made it for himself. But the humans that he created in his image, they decided to rebel against his authority. You know, when I was young, I used to look at Adam and Eve, and I'd be like, why are these guys being punished so harshly? You know, have you ever, have, have, have you ever been found, maybe when your mom comes into the kitchen and then finds, she had told you not to eat sugar, but there's sugar. Imagine her telling you, leave my house and never come back. Hey? It just, I used to be like, that's abusive. That's not right. I'd be like, this is a bit harsh. Can you, what? you know how people say the Old Testament God? That's so Old Testament. I used to be like, this is so harsh. But you see, the problem is I didn't understand what Adam and Eve had done. It wasn't just that they ate daddy's food. <laughs> it's not just that they did the thing they were not supposed to do, like they, like, they, like they ate the thing that God was saving for himself. That's not what's at stake here. What's at stake is that they sided with the enemy. They sided with the enemy. God has an enemy, a rebel, one who was in his kingdom, one whom he created because God created everything. But this rebel decided, no, I'm not following. And he decided, I'm independent. And he did a coup, and he carried a third of the angels in heaven. You read some of these stories in scripture. And he was cast down to the earth. And when he was cast to the earth, God decided to create human beings out of mud, out of mud, the weakest thing in the universe. God creates you out of mud. You're good. To, look at your neighbor. Do they look muddy? Good-looking mud, but mud nonetheless. You're made out of mud. And God, I don't know why he does this. He could have made you out of air, out of big things, but he makes you out of mud. But I think he's making a point. Because guess who has, is in the planet that he's creating? His enemy. And he decides that I'm going to take the weakest thing and I'm going to put my spirit in it. And I'm going to teach the principalities how to obey me through this weak thing. That was God's intention. That through you, a point would be made to all the powers and principalities. And so God puts you there. And guess what they do? The first action is that they choose to listen to the voice of God's enemy and to rebel against their king. And they had been given power over the universe. But they took that power and they decided to disobey God. And God, who is the rightful king, and there's only one king, he says, if you're going to side with the enemy, then you need to leave my presence. And that's what is happening there. It's not that they took an apple they shouldn't have taken. It's that they rebelled. Those are leadership crises. But God did not give, and you know what happened? When, when, when God chased them out, guess what happens? Because God is a source of life, when you cut yourself away from God, you experience death. And so if you've ever done, Mrs., you, talk, you read about the death, we talk about what happened to humans as a result of that rebellion. When we cut ourselves from God, first we experience physical death. Anybody experiencing pain or has experienced pain recently? Yeah, pain. That's physical death. Injuries, sicknesses, disabilities, deformities, infirmity, the infirmity of just old age, death, 
you were not created for those things. Those were not your portion, but they came from rebellion. The second thing is emotional death. Emotional death happened, which is why we suffer from negative emotions, fear, envy, shame, addictions, mental illness. Those things we were not created for, but they became our reality because of death, separation from the source of life. Relational death. Relationship death includes things like loneliness, broken friendships, ugly competitiveness, betrayal, divorce, injustice, oppression. This is not how we were created, but this is how humans are. This is how you have a politician stealing the water from a village. I mean, can you think about it? It's so inhuman that he can actually cause suffering for hundreds of thousands of people just so that he can have money in his bank account. That's brokenness. Humans were not created for that. That is the result of death, emotional death. Environmental death is another thing that happened. This is why we have things like climate change, droughts, earthquakes, natural disasters, tsunamis, all those things. That's not how the universe was created. But the universe is distorted because it is cut off from its God. And then the last one is spiritual death. Spiritual death means that we are separate from God for all eternity. This is what happened to human beings because of our rebellion. Uh, it's interesting because in, in, in spiritual death, you're going to find that desperate attempt to find God in all cultures in the world. All our cultures have desperate attempts to find God. Uh, all our cultures had a concept that something was missing. By the way, if you ask people, what's the difference between human beings and animals? Most people would tell you, oh, human beings are just a bit more intelligent. Uh, that they're on top of the food chain. Uh, this is why human, but otherwise, we're just animals. Ah, I say if you're an animal, I'm not. I'm, I'm made in the image of God. There's no animal that is made in the image of God. And I'll tell you why that is su such a big thing. You will never go to a forest somewhere and find an orangutan worshipping. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? It doesn't matter how intelligent the animals are. You will never see a shrine with gorillas worshipping. The one thing that distinguishes human beings from any other creature is that we are worshipping beings. And the reason we worship is because we realize it's not enough for me to have everything physical around me. There's something missing still. And I need to find it. And all over the world, all cultures have shrines, have ways that they try to reach out to God, the God that they're looking for. This is the human, there's a vacuum inside us. And you know, modern human beings have eliminated religion. They've eliminated God and said we're too civilized for God. But they're still worshipers. They worship money. They worship possessions. They worship power. They worship beauty. They worship sex. They worship health. Don't be fooled by these Westerners who are telling you, oh, you Africans are incurably religious. They're just as religious as we are. It's just that they've replaced their old gods with other gods. There's a vacuum in every human being. There's an emptiness, regardless of how much money you have. And that emptiness can only be filled with a relationship with our Creator. That's a, that's a crisis that humans face. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, But as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You are dead. This is what Paul is saying. You are dead. Without God, you are dead in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. By the way, without Jesus, you're dead. I always find people who say, oh, pastor, but he's such a godly, he's such a good man. In fact, he's even better than Christian men I know in church. I know he is not saved yet, but he comes to church and he has a good family. Have I frozen? I seem, have I frozen? People are not hearing anymore. <laughs> I'm muted. <laughs> yeah, pastor, but pastor, he's Christian. You, you should even know Christian guys, how horrible they are. Yeah. In fact, somebody even said, yeah, in fact, these Christians are the ones who are even killing people for fasting. 
This one, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. No, 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 no. It's not about whether he's good or bad. The issue is whether he's dead or alive. That's the thing. It does, you, if you're dating a corpse, it doesn't matter how beautiful the corpse is. I want to say that to somebody in the room because maybe this is why you came here to hear this. Without Jesus, you are dead. And it's not me who said it. The scriptures say it. You're dead. He's dead. And you're alive. And, Jesus, and the Bible says, what commonality is there between death and life? There's no commonality. There's nothing in common. You're dead. And he says, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. That's who we are without God, deserving of wrath. And it's not just humans that face this crisis, by the way, of rebellion. Romans chapter 8, verse 20 to 22, it says, For against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. The whole world was judged. All creation was judged because of the rebellion of human beings. So why did Jesus come? It wasn't to take you to heaven. That's not why he came. To... <laughs> Jesus came to end your rebellion. Tell your neighbor, Jesus came to end your rebellion. Yeah. He came to end our rebellion because we are rebellious beings. He wanted to, re to end the rebellion of all human beings against God's leadership and through them to restore all creation back to the Father. That's what the gospel is. That he wanted to end, it's, it's about rebels, people who are rebellious, being turned into followers. People who are, who are against God, who are independent, who wanted to do things their way. Now saying, I will do things God's way. Jesus came to end my rebellion. That independent spirit that I have. That feeling of I don't follow anyone. That feeling of I know what's good for me. That sense of I'm going to live life on my own terms. That feeling of, I'll only surrender to God what I feel comfortable surrendering. I'm not ready yet to give him this thing. Oh my goodness, those are works of death. Those are works of rebellion. Those are what Paul calls gratifying the cravings of the flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And Jesus came for those things. He came to end our rebellion. Tell your neighbor, Jesus came to end your rebellion. Yeah, and that's why when Jesus preached, he preached about nothing except the kingdom of God. Kingdom, you know, we don't live in kingdoms, we live in democracy, so we don't understand how powerful that word was. He says the kingdom of God is now here. Those people understood because there was a king. His name was Caesar. So when you talk about another kingdom, they understood you're actually doing a coup at that point. You're actually saying the king who is right now here, he's illegitimate. There's another king who's coming to take over. In those days, because people understood kingdoms, they understood this message is subversive. And this is why they crucified Jesus. This is why that message of his, they understood that what Jesus was saying is, we have to surrender because the king is here. That's the message of the Bible. So the first reason we surrender is because surrender is the reason that Jesus came. I wish somebody told me this when I got saved, by the way. I wasted time. I wish I'd known because I thought I was getting saved so I don't, I don't go to hell. I, did, I wish I knew. Later, later I realized, praise God that I realized. But I wasted some time, if only I'd known. Number two, surrender is the only way to follow Jesus. Surrender is the only way to follow Jesus. Without surrender, you're actually not following. You're saying you're following, but you're not following. I said this when I led prayers a couple of weeks ago. And I said, you know, it's very interesting when I, read, when I read the Gospels, especially right now we're reading the book of John. How many people are doing the, the New Testament in a year? Let me just see a show of hands. Is that amazing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, if you're, if you're not doing it yet, you can still join. Talk to your discipleship group leader, talk to your campus pastor, find out where we are, and just join us in the app. So Jesus has conversations. And I love the book of John because he has a lot of individual conversations. You actually see long conversations with individuals. But the thing I found strange about Jesus when I, read, when I started reading it is he never had the same conversation with, his, with, with two different people. Every person he met, he had a unique conversation because he knew that each person had a unique idol. 
And Jesus never told them, oh, all you need to do is just believe in your heart that I'm God and, and just say, I surrender, I choose you, and now, and I've come in and your life will be good and you can move and just do what you want to do. That's not what Jesus told them. Pray the sinner's prayer and you're here. No, 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 no. He had very different conversations. And when you talk about the rich young ruler in, in the book of Mark, chapter 10, it says that, <laughs> it's Mark chapter 10, verse 21, looking at him, Jesus showed love to him. Have you ever seen that? Like this guy comes to Jesus. Jesus has spoken to many, many rich people before, shared the gospel with them, but this is the one person that he says this. And he says, looking at him, Jesus showed love to him. How did he show him love? He told him, one thing you lack, go and sell all your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. Hey. Some of you are like, that's the kind of love I don't need. <laughs> uh, it sounds like toxic love. Go sell everything and then come and follow me. And yet, the Bible is saying, this is how Jesus is showing love to this man. Why is he showing him? Because he knows the idol is who? For this guy? Money. He knows that the one thing this guy has in his life that will stop him from following God, the thing that is causing him to be rebellious, the idol, is money. And Jesus tells him, Without, with that money in your life, you cannot be my disciple. Eish. Nicodemus. Nick Odemus. <laughs> Nicodemus is the only person that Jesus said, you must be born again. We use that phrase all the time, but it was only given to one person. And you read the scripture, John 3.3. 3. Jesus responded to him and said, truly, truly. In other words, <laughs> like... Like, haki haki. Like, for real, for real. <laughs> like, it's like, it's like, I'm not just saying, now I'm really, I want, to, I want you to understand I'm saying. Like, we're, we're not in the, con now we actually say, it's like I'm stating something you must catch. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There's nobody else that Jesus said that to. Why did he say that to Nicodemus? What was the idol in Nicodemus' life? He had a reputation as a teacher of the law. He was, he, was a, he was a guy who had been educated. He understood theology. He understood the law. And what Jesus was saying, that for him, coming into ending his rebellion was giving up all his accomplishments, his reputation, his wisdom, and becoming like a little child. And coming and understanding again like a child. He's like, you feel, you're too, you, feel you know too much. For you, you must become a child. Enter your it's, Even him is like, how does a man enter his mother's stomach? He's like, he had never heard anything like that. But Jesus is saying, unless you give up that thing that you think is so big, you cannot be my disciple. The Samaritan woman, John chapter 4, verse 16. It says, John 4, 16, he said to her, by the way, can you see all these conversations are different, isn't it? He said to her, go call your husband and come here. Right? <laughs> What? I mean, that, that, like you're, you're having a conversation, then go call your husband and come. <laughs> but you know, the Bible tells us very clearly that, you know, at that point she says, I don't have a husband. She says, I, I know. <laughs> In fact, you've had five men. And the one you're with right now is not even your husband. What was her idol? Relationships. Her idol was romantic relationships. She was in love with being in love. Do you know anyone who's in love with being in love? Do you know someone, by the way, who you've never known them without a relationship in their life? How's Rhoda? Hey, Rhoda, that was last year. <laughs> and it's a, they leave this one, and within a week, they have already rebounded to the next one. Because it's not Rhoda they loved, it was love. The feeling of being in love. And <laughs> poorly Rhoda, I'm so sorry. And Jesus hits at the spot. And says, for you, the one thing that is your idol, that you have to surrender, the thing that is causing you to be a rebel against God, is that need for relationships. You're looking for love in all the wrong places. The thief at the cross, Luke chapter 23, uh, verse 39. It says, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So, you're the Messiah, are you? 
prove it by saying, saving yourself and us too while you're at it. Honey, this guy has been nailed. <laughs> He's hanging. He's suffocating. Ah, you're the Messiah. <laughs> <laughs> But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? And he said, we deserve to die for our crimes, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then look, into this, look at what Jesus says, verse 42. He says, then he, say, oh, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He's still hanging there suffocating. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. What a shock. No, no sinner's prayer. No, lift up your hands and receive Jesus. He says, you're, you're saved. What, was this, what had this man's idol been? Believing in self. Tough guy. He is a rebel. He's a guy of the streets. He's a guy of the mta. He's a guy who has gathered everybody around. People fear him. He's this guy who never shows fear. He's a tough guy. But he says, hey, dude, don't you understand? This guy has done nothing wrong. He's, a lo he's the Lord. And Jesus says, because you've surrendered that idol, today you're with me in paradise. Are you seeing the power of surrender? Yeah. He didn't even repent. He didn't even say, oh, God, forgive me. No, 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 no. No baptism, but he entered heaven. Let me give you one more. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, Luke chapter 19. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Oh my goodness. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Like, but does this kind of mess up with our religious sensibilities? Like this guy has not been baptized. He has not knelt down. The pastor has not laid hands on him. He has not said a sinner's prayer. But just from the moment of him saying that, because what was his idol? Jesus never asked him to give up money. Corruption. There's some people who know how to take shortcuts. And this man had learned to take shortcuts because he even acknowledges, he says, the people I have cheated. <laughs> he's a thief. He's a man who's taken shortcuts. He's a corrupt official. And the minute he recognizes that corruption and says, Jesus, it's done. I surrender my, this thing that has been my God, I give it up. Jesus says, salvation has come to this house. Salvation has come to this house. Ask your neighbor, what's your idol? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because some of us, we prayed the prayer, but that idol is still in our house. Salvation never really came to our house. You see, we live in an age today where many people believe in Jesus, but they don't follow him. They believe in him mentally. There's a, it's theoretical. It's like, I believe there is a God. In fact, I believe his name is Yahweh. I believe he's supposed to be worshipped. In fact, I come to church to worship him because I believe in him. Just don't ask me to follow him. And that's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, 21. Do you ever get scared by this verse sometimes, by the way? He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. There are many people who will come to Jesus and say, Lord, I was in church. I raised my hands. I was one of the worship team. I sang songs. I knelt and cried. I even felt tears in my eyes. Surely, you must know me. He says, I don't know you. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord <laughs> will enter the kingdom of heaven because they did not surrender. And the gospel is about surrender. So the second thing is I'm saying, surrender is the only way. It's the only way. Luke chapter 14, verse 33, another interesting verse. He says, uh, Luke 14, 33, he says, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce But is this a bit wild? Like, he, like, like, who does not renounce, like, some of the things in his life? Does it say that? 
who does not renounce the things that they don't like, <laughs> that they're not feeling. Does he say that? He says what? Does not renounce? Oh! It means you can't have anything. You can't own anything and be a follower of Jesus. He says you cannot, if you do not renounce all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. Ask your neighbor, are you his disciple? Yeah. And really the answer to that question is yes, I've renounced all. I don't own anything. It's his. It's the only way to follow Jesus. And if you're struggling to surrender, it's because you've, nobody explained to you what salvation really meant. Nobody told you what it meant. Number three, there is no such thing as a self-ruled person. There's no such thing as a self-ruled person. You know, we live under this illusion of control, of I'm in charge, of this is my life. We live under that illusion. But that's a lie. We're not in charge. None of us is in charge. None of us has any control of the fact that we are here. I love what Morton said when he was leading, and he said, he gave a thanksgiving, which was a very unusual one. He said, we are here. Like, from, we've, we've made it to the second gathering of 2023. And some of us cheered just because he said it with hype. But you know, it's true. It's by God's grace we are here. In the second gathering of 2023, we had no guarantee we'll be here. None of us has any guarantee we'll be here at Fearless Summit. None of us. It's by grace. It's a gift. We are not in control. There's an anthropologist uh, called Ernest Baker. He was actually, what he, my professor used to talk to him about him a lot. He wrote a book called The Denial of Death. The Denial of Death. And this book, basically, the premise of this book is all human cultures are built around trying to pretend and ignore the fact that people will die. All human cultures, by the way, we create all kinds of things to hide us from the fact that we will die. I mean, it's so funny, whenever you talk to people about, um, that's, in our culture, we don't talk about death much, do we? In fact, if you talk to about death, they'll think, huh, when you want me to die? <laughs> As if my saying anything has anything to do with you dying. There's only one day that's appointed for you to die. And I'm not in control, and neither are you. When your time comes, you will go. But we've made this illusion that we're in control, that we're the ones who are in charge. James chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know, it's very interesting because this world is a contested space. It's a contested space. There's no leadership vacuum. If you're not under the leadership of Jesus Christ, you're under the leadership of the devil. And the only way to resist the devil is what? Submit yourselves to God. That's the only thing. Because there's no contested space. That illusion of I'm in charge. I'm in charge just means I'm a servant of the devil. That's why the devil never tells Eve, worship me. He says, God is lying to you. You will be like God. <laughs> he said, worship yourself. Because he knows he doesn't need to get you to worship him. Just worship yourself and you're already his servant. And that's exactly what happens to Eve. She's like, yeah, maybe I can actually be like God. She doesn't understand. She's just put herself under the foot of the enemy. There is no such thing as a self-controlled person, as a self-in-charge person. If you're in charge of yourself, you are under the devil's control. And the only way you'll ever be free of the devil's control in your life is what? Submit yourself to God. It's the only thing. You surrender and you release yourself to God. God's desire is to establish himself as your loving king. Because he's a loving king, he knows it is best for you to be ruled by him and to follow the plan he created you for than for you to be ruled by your own passions or by other spiritual forces that are determined to destroy you. Now, the interesting thing is, this thing is not about an intellectual argument. Oh, I believe. Remember, it's not about believing. It's about following. It's about a new control, a new order, new management. Something else takes over my life. I am no longer in control. Number four, surrender saves my life. Surrender saves my life. You know, that thing of, if I surrender to God, he might take something away from me that I really want. <laughs> I need to protect myself from God. That's what that thought is saying. That if I allow him too much room, he might interfere. In fact, I used to say, to, I used to say those days, by the way, me, I, I really believe in serving God. Um, 
I really want to serve God. Uh, I'll get a good job and get a lot of money so I can be passing it on to the church. So I'll be serving. <laughs> Just don't ask me to be a pastor. <laughs> that, was one, that was mine, by the way. Remember when you said that you, you feared surrendering to God, he might ask you to be. For me, it was being a pastor. It's like, God, you know, if I, it's like I will be a rich businessman. And I'm telling you, any church I go will be blessed. I will be the biggest tither in that church, God. Watch me. Watch me. In fact, I want to go to Pastor Kelvin's church. Any pastor I serve will be blessed. And I said this to myself. I was like, Lord, just watch me. Just bless me so I can bless your church. Just don't ask me to be a pastor. That was my thing. It's like I don't want to be. I don't want to serve in the church. Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. says a very interesting thing. It says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Let's read that last part together. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Oh my goodness. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet for faith their soul? What can someone give in exchange for their soul? That's a very powerful image. Imagine a guy who has gained the whole world, a girl who's gained the whole world. What does that look like to you? He chopped the money. What is he doing? What is that guy doing? He's, he's, uh, he's, it's that sports pesa picture, you know. Money is raining. He's raining money. He's made the, come on, what's your picture of a person who's made the whole world, gained the whole world? They're famous, isn't it? How many followers do they have on social? It's like they own social media. Everybody's watching them. They have so much influence. They're in charge of everything. They've gained the whole world. And God says, what a tragedy to do that and lose the most important thing, your soul, the very being of who you are. You know, I remember re meeting uh, a very rich tycoon. <laughs> I, I went to my friend's house. My friend was moving out because the landlord was tearing down the house to put up some apartments. Uh, this was in Lovington. Lovington is a very uh, expensive area for those who are not from here. And this guy had a big house almost on a whole acre. And he had been renting it. His company was renting it for him. So he called me to come to his house. He had left, but he said, I left some flowers. And if you know me, me, I'm a guy of plants. So he said, Pasi, I've left some flowers I planted. I know they're going to tear them down. So just go and collect them. So I went with my car and my, my tools. And I was just collecting plants when this old man shows up in his big, expensive car. And he asked, so who are you? So I recognize he must be the owner. So I said, oh, I'm so-and-so, I'm a pastor, and I'm here to get some flowers that my friend left. And we started talking. We just became, somehow we just started having this conversation. The guy was old. He was in mid-80s, going to 90s, and, but very wealthy. Can you tell when you meet a wealthy guy? I mean, even the cologne he's smelling just smells, it smells like it can, it can buy me, you know? <laughs> it's, like, it's like the guy looks so rich. But he's there humbly, um, and, and he had come to oversee the tearing down of the house. And we started talking, and I, I, I realized we hit off very quickly. I, I saw him like, and I told him, hi, dad, uh, I'm doing this. So I think maybe he was endeared because I called him dad. And we, he said, oh, sit down, young man, let's talk. We talked. He asked me about myself. And then I asked him a question. I said, at your age, I just felt emboldened because of how, he told me he owns, by the way, a huge group of schools, very famous, uh, big industry. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a he, he, I didn't know him, but he's a very well-known person, very, very loaded. And I asked him, Dad, at your age, why are you here? Why aren't your sons the ones who are building these houses? I, I mean, I, I thought at your age you should be more relaxed. And he told me a very interesting story. He said, you know what, my sons, I've got four sons. Uh, two of them live in the U.S., one lives in the U.K. Uh, they don't want anything to do with me. Uh, I haven't seen them for years. They don't talk to me. Um, their mom went 10 years ago to apparently look after their children when their children were born. She's never come back. Uh, she says, I have one son left in the country, and he's an alcoholic. He's always in rehab. She says, none of them is interested in what I do. And I asked, so why are you still doing it? You, you've got money. He says, this is all I know what to do. This is all I know to do. You know, at that moment, it struck me. Oh, my goodness. This guy is exactly where 99% of Kenyans would want to be. Rich. Everything that the world can give you. Gain the whole world. 
but he's the loneliest person I'd ever met. Lonely. Yeah, there were people who asked him about friends. All his friends liked him because of money, and he knew it. He had nobody. And he was going to do this until the day he died. I don't know if he's still alive. I haven't, I haven't talked to him. We haven't kept in touch since then. But the Bible says, ah, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. That's a man who had lost his life. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. Investing your life for the sake of Jesus and for his gospel is the best thing you can ever do. Surrendering to God's plan for you is the best thing you can ever do. Number five, surrender leads to true satisfaction. It leads to true satisfaction. You know, God is... God is not that father that you feared. God is not that harsh father. God is not that boss that took advantage of you. God is not that harsh teacher that you knew. Because sometimes we get mixed up. The, the human models we have of fathers confuse our picture of God. And so we have this fearful picture of surrender. It's like, no, 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 I never want to be in a place where I'm vulnerable to someone who can take advantage of me. Because we've seen people with power taking advantage of weak people. But Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 29, tells us something completely different. He says, come to me. This is what surrender is. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Verse 29. Listen, take my yoke. Take my yoke just means, take, let me take leadership over your life. Surrender your leadership to me. Take my leadership in your life. And he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. You find rest for your soul. God is such a loving God. He's powerful, but he's kind. He's powerful, but he loves you. When you submit to him, it's not so that he can dominate you. It's that he can help you be everything he created you to be. That's who he is. Ah, come on, somebody. Imagine if I became a rich pharmacist giving money to the church. What kind of small life would I have lived? That's not what I was created for. I was created to serve my maker. Because of serving, because of following him, I found rest. I enjoy my life. I look back. In fact, recently, one of my friends in this church told me, Pastor M, um, you, you, you lead well. If you ever run for office, you have my vote. I said, listen, why would I lower myself from what I'm doing to run for any other office? Ah, I'm serving the king of kings. I live for him. I, I wouldn't leave what I'm doing. I love it. I'm doing what I was created for. It gives rest to my soul. Too many people are harassed in their soul. They're running after things that don't satisfy them. They're destroying their families in the process because they're so afraid of trusting God. They're so afraid of yielding and surrendering to his plan. And, and they believe that I have to look after myself. This is all I know. And they don't understand. My goodness, God is saying, come to me. You're weary. You're heavy laden. I will give you rest. I'll give you rest. You know, carrying the whole world on your shoulders is a lot of work. Hey, it's stressful. It is stressful. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I've preached things in this church. I've preached that the Bible's way is the best. And I've always said, you know, the Bible says the borrower is a slave. You know, there are many people who've had me preach that many years. And yet, they don't believe me. <laughs> or rather, they don't believe the Bible. They still borrow. Tell your neighbor, why do you think they still borrow, by the way? Just, just, I'd love to hear. Why do people still do it? I, I, why do people still do it? Why do you think people still borrow, even though they've heard it preached from the pulpit, that that's not God's plan for them? That's not what God wants for them. Why do you think people still justify it, find ways to prove that, yeah, there must be, the Bible can't be really right, there must be good loans and not, not, not everything is bad? Why do you think people are so determined? Let me just see a few answers. Why, why, why? It's easier. 
Yeah, I feel like it's easier. If I wait, I have no guarantees. It gives me control. At least I know where the money is coming from and when it's coming. Other reasons? The what? They're afraid. Maybe I might trust God. He doesn't come through. Yeah. So let me just do what I know I have control over, huh? The opportunity might miss me. I could be here praying and people are buying the land. And the day I come, that land was already sold. In fact, the price is five times. Uh-huh. You, 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 it's like, it's, it, this is too long. I have no guarantees with the long way. Why aren't you guys telling me why you borrow, by the way? Why are you telling me what other people do? Uh, this thing might take so long. I might be poor for too long. Me, I don't want to be poor for another 10 years. This thing might take too long. Uh-huh. Yeah, just shout it out. Waiting, <laughs> waiting is hard. Oh, you guys don't look like you identify with that one. Waiting is hard. It's hard. Yes, God says I'd wait, but I'm like, I don't want to wait. Those who wait on the Lord, hey, waiting is hard. It's easier to sing about it than to do it, isn't it? Yeah. Social status. This is not the kind of person I am. I should not, I deserve to live in this kind of place. Everybody is doing it. Surely they can't all be wrong. By the way, that's the most foolish thinking you've ever heard of, yeah? Have you ever seen guys crossing thicker roads sometimes? Like 10 guys all running. And it's like, as long as we're together, we can't be killed. <laughs> sometimes I just say, oh God, save us from foolishness. Complete foolishness. It's like that truck, will, it can't miss now. You're so many, it can't miss. <laughs> it's the stupidest thing. We can't, we are, all of us can't be wrong. We can't all die. What? <laughs> oh God. You know, it's interesting. Jesus says, my way will give you rest. Surrender gives you rest. It does. He knows why he made you. When God says wait, it's because it's the best thing for you. And because he's teaching you something. And when God blesses, he will bless you. When your time comes for God to bless you, he will bless you. But God offers satisfaction freely for those who do things his way. And the confidence we have is he's a loving God. He's a loving God. Why, why is it the best thing for me to surrender to his will? Because he's a loving God. He has my best interest at heart. He has my best interest at heart. You know, I, I've told you guys how maybe about eight years ago I started doing, I, 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 develop, I, I, plan, I started a development. And it was such a big thing. It was the biggest thing I'd ever done. And we soon hit roadblocks because anywhere we went, the government officials asked for bribes. And it was so hard because I determined and I said to the team, do not bribe. Never. I said, if you bribe, you use your money because me, we are not, we are not bribing for this project. And I said to anybody who worked for me, the minute you bribe, I fire you. Now, the problem is I'd sold land to people and I was the one helping start the development. So I can't tell you how many times I felt, Lord, my reputation is at stake. I remember people who called me and said, Pastor M, this thing is taking too long. Can I have my money back? I remember one person who was so harsh, they actually sent a lawyer's letter and demanded their money with interest. And when I said, that was not in the contract, they said, talk to my lawyer, I'm going to sue you. He's a Christian, by the way. And they demanded, I think it was like a million shillings interest. And I didn't have the money. But because, and I, and, and, I, and, and, and I remember at that point, I cried. I actually cried tears. I said, God, look what you're doing to me. And the Lord said, pay her. <laughs> it was painful. I paid every cent, slowly paid that money. The project still wasn't happening. Do you know, it's so interesting that it took eight years before we finally broke ground. In that time, many people had left. Others had come. But you know the interesting thing for me is when I look at it now, I see all the reasons why now is the right time and not eight years ago. Now I can see it. By the way, as I was going through it, I couldn't see it. But now I can see it. There's certain things that have happened in the area that have made it the perfect time to develop now. There's certain things that have happened with the people who left that have made me realize they were not the right people. <laughs> and it's like all the time I'm like, God, why? And God is like, wait wait, wait. Yeah. 
So don't fear him. God is, don't fear that he has your worst at, in his heart. God has your best interest at heart. Let your fear, when it says fear the Lord, doesn't mean fear that he's going to take advantage of you. <laughs> That's not what it's saying. God has your best interest at heart. And those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. You know, it's very interesting. The land that people I, I, I refunded was painful to refund. Today I'm selling that land at five times what I was selling it at that time. Who knew that the waiting was how God was going to answer my prayer to give me resources? But here I was ready to take all kinds of shortcuts, saying, God, move. But I'm so grateful that I waited. And for some of you, yeah, God is saying, surrender. My way may look difficult, but it's the best thing you could ever do. Number six, surrender brings reward now and in the future. Now and in the future. You know, God is the king who owns all resources. He's the one who knows why he made us. He knows what's best for us. When you know that, then you realize surrender is actually not a sacrifice. It's the best thing you could ever do. It's the best thing you could ever do. Yeah, it's the best thing. Surrendering is the best thing you could ever do. My goodness. I'm just thinking, you're, you're going into business with Elon Musk. And then he says, everybody, I need a million shillings from you, and I'll put my million. Will you look for a million to put in there? <laughs> you will find that money. You, you might even take a loan if it was you. <laughs> ah, Pastor M said loans, no, this is Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> He's my partner. Listen, your partner is the king of kings. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's incredible. He's all powerful. It's interesting because Peter at one point, they had sacrificed so much, they had surrendered so much, he was like, I, I don't see it. And in Mark chapter 10, verse 28, Peter said to Jesus, behold, <laughs> behold, I like that word. Anybody? Behold, we should start using that word again. Behold, <laughs> I've left everything and followed you. Do you have that verse? Mark chapter 10, verse 28. Behold, we've left everything and followed you. He's telling Jesus, Jesus, like seriously, we've left everything. Do you understand? I left my business. Like I left, I left my father's business. I left my inheritance. I left everything that I'd been brought up for to follow you, Jesus. Do you understand how much I've given up? And Jesus says to him, Verse 29, let's go to the next one if you have it. Verse 29, after he said, come on somebody, are you, is there, are you having a problem with your computer? Yes, Jesus replied. And I assure you that everyone who has given up, let's say it, house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news. Verse 30. This guy, I want you to know what Jesus is about to say. <laughs> so, does Jesus sometimes ask us to give up all those things? Yes. But he says, we'll receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property along with persecution. <laughs> There's that little part as well, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Surrender has persecution to it. He's not, he's not hiding. It's not fine print. It's right there. It's not, he's saying it's not easy for you to surrender. You will get the persecution, but along that, look at what will come. And then he says, and the most important part, and in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. Houses, A hundred times houses. Come on, somebody. What does that even mean? Brothers, sisters, mothers. <laughs> wow. Properties. Any kikuyus in the house? Yeah, he's talking to you. Properties. Proti maguta maguta. 
a hundred times. Eish. Eish. <laughs> Kamulu Joska. <laughs> 100 by 100. Bypass coming here. <laughs> Ready title. Whish. See what connected. <laughs> by the way, Jesus doesn't lie. He says it. I want to tell you, I'm living proof of that 100 times. I'm living proof. He actually blesses surrender. He does. He gives you everything. In Mark chapter 6, he says a very powerful thing. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things. They'll be added to you. They'll be added. He actually says, I'm a rewarder. You can surrender because there are benefits to surrendering to him. You're partnering with the richest being of the universe. You're partnering with the one who keeps his word. He will bless many times. But here's the amazing thing that I like about it. Is when you live surrendered and God gives you those things, they no longer define you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't define you. By the way, I have so many plots. If you ask me how many plots I have, I don't know. I'm serious. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> Pastor Kev says him, he just has an evening plot. <laughs> Ask your neighbor, what kind of plot do you have? Because <laughs> some of you have a plot after this. Yeah. But you know, here's the thing. When you're surrendered, and God gives you that thing, it's his. God can tell you, give it away, and you give it away without even a thought. It's not yours. In fact, the question you ask is, God, why have you given me this? What do you want me to do with it? Because it's yours. It's yours. It's huge. It's yours. Yeah. <laughs> it's yours. Wow. Gosh. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not preaching well enough here. I'm not sure you guys are hearing it. Guys, God is a rewarder. God is a rewarder. Tell your neighbor, God is a rewarder. I feel, I feel like I need to tarry here, but God is a rewarder, people. Yeah, he is. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich without sorrow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, God, he's a rewarder. Is a rewarder. You know, if I was to be called to go into public office and they asked me to declare my wealth, they'd be shocked. They'd have to come and see, did this guy, get, did this guy steal money from Avuno Church? Yeah. Then they'd even be more shocked because they'd realize I've not received a salary from Avuno for the last four years. Yeah. And that all the pay slips of the money I received before that, were, they're all there. <laughs> What a shock. Yeah, yeah. I, I told the people in Hill City when I preached, I had, I had, I, 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 my wife and I, during the fast fruit, when we gave our fast fruit, um, we, were, we were so shocked because God called, I mean, God got this guy to call us. There's a guy who offered us land that blew our minds. I mean, he gave it to us, told us, he called me and said, Pastor, I want you to buy this land. It's land that is close to the development that I'm doing. And I should have brought you pictures of the development, by the way. I should, maybe I'll show them to you another time. But he said, I want to sell you this land. And when he mentioned the amount of money, um, I wasn't going to take it. But my wife clearly said, had God say, this is your gift. This is yours. And so we took it. He actually said, I want you to buy this land, pastor. Someone has offered me full cash for it but I don't think I want them to be your neighbor. They won't be a good neighbor for you. So he said, here's a plot. Here's a, here's a, here is the title deed. Go and think, and then tell me how you'll pay me. 
<laughs> yeah. What land? Okay, maybe I should stop. You know, Paul, Paul says there are things that I'm, maybe I'm boasting now. Maybe there are things I shouldn't say. That land at government valuation, not at current market value, is worth 140 million shillings. Not Zimbabwean. <laughs> yeah? This was in January, during the fast. Currently, what I owe is 18 million shillings. Yeah. And it's going to get paid in the next couple of months. Yeah. You know, even I shake as I share this, sir. But I just feel in my spirit, I want someone to get it here. <laughs> this is not me. This, this is not me. When God asked me to surrender, the first thing I, he, I struggled the most with is because I wanted to be a rich man. I wanted to have money. I didn't want to be poor. The two, the two biggest fears in my life, one was to be poor and the other, the other one was to die. I didn't want to die young and I didn't want to be poor. And I was like, God, I can't, I can't. And God was like, you must. So when you're hearing me say these things, it's not because I have any ability or wisdom. All glory goes to him. Even if I was to tell you how that, that money has been paid, you would not believe. You know, Paul says, there are things you cannot believe. There are even things I can't tell you. There are, ways, there are things I don't tell you as my church because you won't believe them. You won't believe them. God is a rewarder. Surrendering to God is the best thing you can ever do with your life. He, can, he will not, he cannot be a debtor to any man. God is a rewarder. He says all things will be added. Some of us have spent our whole life chasing all things, running after all things, running and they're running away from you as you're running towards them. And when you think you're catching them, they're even running faster. And Jesus says, follow me. Seek first my kingdom, my righteousness. Guess what happens? All things. Yeah, there's this song we say, your goodness is running after. It's running after me. I want you to sing that song the next time with knowledge. That's what that song is saying. You might sing it without understanding what you're saying. Maybe you are running after things and you're saying your goodness is running. You don't even know what that means. But God is saying, I want my goodness to run after you. And the only way that will happen is if you let go. Let go of that idol. Surrender. What do I surrender? Let me just very quickly, because my time is going. Matthew 16, 24. It talks about the nature of surrender. The nature of surrender. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves take up their cross and follow me. Very, very powerful words. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, follow me. Three things in that passage. Number one, deny myself. Deny myself has to do with let go of control. Tell your neighbor, let go. Let go. Every aspect of your life, you let go. The things that are included here, I, I, I want to say, I, I, at least as far as I've found in my life, there, there, there are several things that, that I need to let go of. Number one is all that I am. My identity. Some of us, identity is what defines us. This has to do with reputation, family background, qualifications. Those things that define who you are. And he's saying, let go. Identity. It's not yours. Serving God might make you look foolish. Yes, it might. Serving God might make people say bad things about you. Yes, it might. Let go. Number two, all that I have. So the first one was all that I am. Number two, all that I have. That has to do with your possessions. They could be physical possessions, bank account, your house, your car, your investments, your job, the things you own. 
Or they could even be attributes. For some of you, it's personality. Your good looks. Come on, somebody. Some good-looking person here. <laughs> your health. Things that you own. Those are your possessions. All that I have. And then number three, all that I hope to be. All that I hope to be. That has to do with your aspirations, your dreams, your ambitions, your desire to be rich. Maybe you grew up in poverty and you're like, I never want to be rich. I never want to be poor. I will never be poor. I cannot be poor because my people are poor. I hate poverty. Your desire to be happily married. Your desire to have children. Your desire to have a certain level of education. Your desire to be famous, to be healthy, to be happy. These are things you desire. And God is saying, let go. Your following Jesus might mean you become poor. Let it be. Lord, if following you means I'm poor, I will follow. If following you means that I don't look very good, <laughs> I will follow. That's what God is asking us to die to. Paul wrote in Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual worship. I believe that today God wants us to make a commitment to let go of ourselves. All that I am, all that I have, all that I hope to be, I give to you. So he says, deny yourself. That's giving up. Number two, he says, take up my cross. Take up my cross. What does this mean? This has to do with following Jesus' example and embracing his plan for your life as opposed to your plan for your life. It's saying, God, I will do what you want me to do. Jesus says some powerful words in that garden of Gethsemane. He says in Luke 22, verse 42, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but yours. Yours be done. And Jesus is saying, of course I don't want this plan. Of course I prefer the plan I had for myself. Of course this plan is going to lead me into a certain level of pain that I don't want. But Lord, I choose to take up your plan for me. Not my will, but yours. Maybe some of you are in that place where it's like, God, I want to succeed. I want to be this. I want to be known in my industry. Yet not my will but yours be done. Lord, I've been in pain. I've been holding on and saying, Lord, you have to heal me. And Lord, I desire healing. Yet not my will, but yours be done. It's taking up. And Jesus is saying today, somebody needs to take up their cross and say, Lord, I will serve you regardless. I will serve you regardless. And then the last thing is follow. To follow. And you know, it's interesting, we've been learning this whole year about following, haven't we? If you're not, fo if you're not a disciple, I mean, if, you're, if you don't follow, you cannot be a disciple. If you're not commandable, then you're not a disciple. And Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's one thing to say you love God. It's a whole th different thing to say, I follow God regardless. And this radical thing that we're learning is that everything wants that God wants for me, that one of the things that God will do for me is put a discipler in my life because God's mandate for His church is discipleship. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. He's saying, if you want to follow Christ, if you want to be like Jesus, then follow me as I follow Jesus. Now some of you would say, I'm not so sure about this following a human being thing. I'm not so sure about following particular human beings. Maybe some of you, it's particular human beings. I'd follow willingly if it was Jesus. Anybody ever thought like that? Yani, if Jesus was the one and he told me, follow me, even me, I'd follow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Following Jesus, even me, I'd leave my boat. But how many know that even in Jesus' time, he told people follow and they didn't follow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are many people, the rich young ruler who was sad because he had too much to lose if he followed Jesus. So even in Jesus' time, people did not follow. Some of you might say, I would follow if it was Paul, the Apostle Paul himself. But how many people know that Paul was not accepted by all the people who encountered him? 
And people began, people rejected him. In fact, the book of 2 Corinthians, you're going to read passages where he's trying to prove himself. He's saying, I'm not, am, I, am I not as qualified as these other apostles? And he says, just because I support myself with the work of my hands, that's what he says. He says, just because I support myself and I don't ask you for money, now you're seeing me as nothing. And they used to insult Paul. They'd say, that guy is only loud through his letters. But he doesn't really, I mean, he talks loudly. He talks loudly when he writes. And you read his, the anguish in his letters because even the people in his own churches wouldn't follow him. They wouldn't follow him. They rejected him because he wasn't trained as a speaker. He was not eloquent like others. He had to defend himself to the church. But I sense that in this season, God is saying, you cannot follow me if you will not follow the, the person I've put to lead you. Yeah. You can't. Some of you have stressed your discipleship group leaders. Yeah. They say, let's meet physically. And you're like, I, me. <laughs> yeah. There are some DG leaders here who have almost quit. They call meeting, nobody comes. The pastor says, if, if, I, if it was Pastor Kilonzi who called me, I would come. Yeah. If he calls me, I'll come to his house. But to my DG leader's house, I'm busy. Doesn't, do they know that I'm busy? On a Wednesday night, and they're asking me to show up. Yeah? If it was Pastor M, I'd come, but I. And you've just disregarded the authority that God has put in your life. And God is saying, you cannot be my disciple if you will not follow. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Have you been trying to save your life? Have you been holding on, saying, God, I can't trust you? And God is saying, today, today I want you to obey. So God is asking us to do three things. Number one, he wants us to put down. And I don't know if there's a piece of paper that you found when you came in. Uh, I'd ask them to do that. If not, you have a notebook. Uh, I'd like you to actually write. I'd like us to end with us actually doing an action. I sense that there's some things God wants you to put down. And even as, you sp I, as I speak, there's some things very clearly that some of you know. God has told me to stop this. Either he's told you to stop it or you know it's an idol in your life. If God was to ask you to stop that job, you wouldn't. You would really struggle. If God was to ask you to give up that house, you would really struggle. If God was to ask you to give up your family and go somewhere else, you would, you would, <laughs> yeah. You'd say, get thee behind me, Satan. Yeah. What are those things that God is showing you already that he wants you to put down? And putting down doesn't mean you sell it. It just means you say to God, it is yours. It is yours. From today, it's not mine. Whatever you ask of this, it is yours. I want you to write at least one or two things that God is saying, put down. So right now, just, just write, even as we're in this place. I believe it's a holy moment and God wants us to surrender. Put it down. What is it that God says? Put it down. For me, it was my career. My plans to be a rich pharmacist. And God said, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Some of you, it's a situation that you know you shouldn't be in, but you're in. And God is saying, surrender it. The way you're running that business, the way you're conducting that relationship, put it down. You're dishonoring me. Put it down. Just write it down. This is not something you're going to share with anybody. Just put it down. And then the second thing, God wants us to take up. There are some of you, you've heard God ask you to take up something. Some of you, God has asked you to lead at a certain level, to share at a certain level, to start a ministry in a different place. And you've heard it, but you've been praying about it. <laughs> you've been postponing it. You've been delaying it. And God is saying, it's time for you to just say, Lord, withholding nothing. It's yours. I will take up this thing. Your pastor has asked you to lead a discipleship group. Whatever it is that the Lord has been speaking to you about, you've been afraid. But God is saying, take it up. Write that thing. And say, Lord, from today, I take this up. I will do it. I will not be afraid. I'll follow you. Or maybe I'll be afraid, but I'll still follow you. And then number three, is follow. 
In what areas have you struggled to follow in this season? In what areas have you struggled to follow in this season? And I want you to just write it down. I mean, maybe for you, this whole following conversation has been a difficult one. And what are the things that have kept made it difficult for you? Is it trust? Is it past experience, pain, fear? Is it just your independence, independent spirit? Is it your orphan spirit? Just that sense that I don't belong? What is it? And just put it down there because Jesus is saying, today I want you to give that thing up because I want you to follow. I want you to learn to be a follower. I want you to humble yourself that I will lift you up. I just sense that God is really dealing with us as we write those things down. The day I came to God and I wrote the things he was asking me to give up. Ah, I'd never cried like that. I wept. I wept because I knew my life was not going to be the same when I walked out of that room. I wept because I knew I was taking, the Lord was taking me seriously and I needed to take him seriously as well. I wept so many tears. I wept as I gave up my dreams to be a pharmacist. That's what I spent my whole university gearing towards. I'd even received an acceptance letter from a prestigious university. I, 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 I wept over that. I wept over the fact that I had wanted to be the first millionaire in my class. And everybody knew that this guy was going to do it. And I was making money already, even at that age, at 22. And I wept. Because I knew from today, if the Lord asked me to be poor, I was going to do it. In fact, I knew I was poor because it wasn't mine anyway. And I gave it up. And I wept over my relationship. I wept because I was dating a beautiful girl who I loved with all my heart. And I wept. You know, you know the story now that she's sitting here. So you know that that didn't end the way I thought. But that day I, I wept because I said, Lord, she's yours. She's yours. She's not mine. I'm not going to control this. If you ask of her, she's yours. And I wept. I actually cried. I remember being broken and just crying. I wept because I had a reputation. And people thought a certain way about me in my university days. And I, I thought of myself standing up and if God asked me to preach in buses <laughs> and being ridiculed and thrown things at. And I wept because my reputation was so important to me. And I wept. I said, God, it's yours. My health was so important to me. I was those guys, I used to work out. I was such a, I, I played rugby and I felt so fit. And I said, God, this is your gift. I give it back. If you afflict me with illness, it's yours. I will not, I do not, you do not owe me anything. It's all yours. My life is yours. I wept tears. I wept a whole afternoon as I gave up those things. I still remember. <laughs> yeah, I thought my life was finished. And in a sense it was. But you know guys, from that moment on, that's the first time I started hearing God's voice. I'd never heard God's voice before. I used to wonder, how does God speak to people? But it's like God was just waiting for me to do this. And then he started speaking to me. You know what the first thing God ever told me was? He told me, you'll never be a rich pharmacist. <laughs> what a shock. But I didn't cry because I'd already cried. It was over. I said, sour. Second thing he told me is, you're going to be a pastor. <laughs> Sour. I didn't cry. I was like, done. I gave it up. Third thing he told me, I was 22, remember? He said, marry Carol. That was not in my plan. Like, we're dating, we're going to go to Masters, Nini. By the time I'm 30, I have a nice car and a house to take her. Like Marie Carol. I said, God, that can't be you. I was living in my father's house and she was still in her father's house. I said, Go and ask her father for her hand in marriage. After a long struggle, I finally said yes and I went and asked. And the man was a skeptic, non Christian, 
very skeptical about people who are thinking about ministry like now by that time I'd already said I'm going to be a pastor and I said Lord if this man kicks me out it's okay so you sent me <laughs> to my shock the man said yes he said call your father I think you'll be a good son in law I went and told my dad I thought my dad would laugh I mean imagine your 22 year old in your house telling you he's getting married my father said you're a man of God and if God has said it to you let's do this do you know my wedding was free the whole wedding was paid for i didn't pay for a cent like it was a fantastic wedding it wasn't cheap by the way it was a nice wedding but it was all paid for including flights to mombasa and back and nine nine nights in two five star hotels i didn't have any money my parents weren't rich but i belonged to the richest one in the universe my partner is the richest one in the universe and that's been the story of my life i say lord it's all yours even now i say lord all the things i have are yours nothing i have is mine <laughs> i surrendered it to you all those years ago I own nothing. I own nothing. It's all yours. I'm the poorest man in this world because I own nothing, even the clothes on my back. But I thank you, Lord, that you will never forsake me. The children I have are yours. My wife is yours. My house is yours. My car is yours. My friends are yours, my reputation is yours. Everything. This church is yours. Should you choose to have it, Lord, it's yours. It's yours. Lord, take it if you want it. It's yours. May I never live for my own ambition. May I never live for myself. Oh God, I want to live for you and only you. I want to live for nothing else but your glory. I want my life to burn. I want my life to bring people to you. I want my generation to know you, Lord. Lord, I want you to be pleased with me. That's all I live for. Nothing else. My health is yours. I don't demand it of you. My house is yours. I don't demand it of you. Should you take away that whole thing, take it, Lord. It's yours. Everything I have, Lord, is to be used for your glory. It's not for me. It's yours. And Lord, any time you see me holding on to it, pull my fingers off. I I pray this in front of your children. Lord, may I never preach but not mean this thing. I completely give my life to you, Lord. I'm not afraid of dying, Lord. If I was to die right now, I've lived for you. and i'm not afraid because my life belongs to you fear is not my portion in jesus name i'm not afraid of provision even if i don't have food i will worship you jesus even if things are go wrong for me everywhere i will worship you jesus even if there's persecution i will worship you jesus because i belong to you i belong to you 100% and lord i'm praying that lord you would bring these sons and daughters to that place of surrender as well that lord together we will experience the joy of surrender the joy of not owning anything the joy of being living sacrifices on your altar that lord you will do what you want in us do what you want in us And so just speak to your father right now just make your own prayer of surrender just say god i surrender myself to you right now take it it's yours it's yours lord i will not hold on to it if you're watching on video as well let me just ask you if you would do the same let's go to our knees god's people let's go on our knees and just come before god right now and say receive this sacrifice lord my life belongs to you
you, oh Father. Speak your surrender to him right now. Whatever it is, he's asked you to surrender. Surrender it to him right now. Say it's yours, Lord. just ask right now if we could take a moment and just say Lord I'm sorry you gave me gifts but I've held on to those gifts I've made it about me I've thought I've acted like those gifts are life but you are life I've made idols out of the gifts you've given me I've held on to them and tried to protect them from you just cry out to God right now let me just ask though just if we could just take a moment Let's just cry out to God, even, even without a song right now. Just cry out to God, cry out to God, cry out to God. Say, God, forgive me. God, I surrender. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me for trying to be in control. Forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me for being self-preoccupied so that I don't even have space for my children. I don't have space for my family. I'm so preoccupied. I've held on to things I have no business holding on to. Just, call, just speak to your father right now. Some of you right now, you're in a place of sin. You're in a place that is in defiance of God. And you say, God, forgive me. I've held on because I've been afraid. I thought you couldn't provide what I needed. But you're a rewarder. Oh God, hear the cries of your people right now in this place. Hear our cries, Lord, as we lay our surrender before you. God, we are surrendering these things and we are saying they're yours. They're yours, God. They're yours. Jesus. Jesus. Just come and receive us as we, as we surrender. There's some of you, you're actually feeling some physical pain as you're surrendering right now. That thing has defined you for so long. And there's actually pain as you surrender. There's so much fear. And God is saying it's okay. It's okay. I know, I know, I'm here, I'm here for you, just let it go. Some of you, the devil has held you in that situation for so long, but right now you're breaking loose, you're breaking out. God is breaking you out of that prison of idolatry. You will not be defined. Some of you, you're afraid because you know that after this, that something drastic is about to happen in your life. There's some things you're giving up right now that you've been afraid to give up for so long and you don't know how it's going to be when you leave this place. But you're saying, God, I still choose to trust you. I will not hold on to myself. I will trust you, Lord. I will trust you. Uh, there's somebody here, there's some practices in your business that have been dishonoring to God and you've been so afraid to stop them because that's the only way you know how to provide for your family. And you're so afraid. Like, God, how will I survive? How will I survive? <sighs> I just said somebody's in so much pain right now and fear. You're like, God, how will I survive if I let go of this thing? Ah, the Lord Father says, it's okay. Just bring it to me. Bring it to me. I love you. You will. I will take you through. Some of you might be about to enter a season of persecution because of this commitment you're making. And Jesus said it will come, but it will also come with reward. And so just release your surrender. Father, we surrender, we surrender, we surrender, we surrender. We're not going to try and control the outcomes anymore. We're just going to walk with you, Lord. We're going to trust you. We're going to trust you, Lord. We're going to choose to trust you. I just sense there's someone who needs to let go of that marriage. 
you've been trying with all your strength to hold it together. And God is saying, it's time for you to release it to me. Just trust me. Stop trying to manipulate it. Stop trying to push it. Just release it to me in prayer and let me do what I can do. Whether it works out the way you want it or not, I need you to trust me. And so right now, just release, release. Some of you, it might feel like dying to make that release. But God is inviting you into this journey of surrender. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So, Lord, receive living sacrifices as we put ourselves on the altar. We say, receive this living sacrifice. We are your worship. We don't come with a song. We don't come with a gift right now. We come with our lives. And we surrender our lives on your altar. And we say, receive them. I pray that Mavuno Church will be a church of surrendered people. I pray that, Lord Jesus, this will be an, an army of surrendered people. No longer alive, no longer living for ourselves, but Christ lives in us. That everything from today will be you. You and you only. You and you only. We thank you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus.